Hey everyone, Ben Coomer Radio, episode number 415 of Ben Coomer Radio, and good God, I am excited for today's show. So, right back in the early days of this podcast, I got an incredible guest on the show, the episode did really well at the time it's still listened to uh, very well and since that podcast went live his career has continued to skyrocket and he's now in a place talking about something that a huge amount of us struggle with when it comes to health and fitness and it's all centered around our habits and routines because ultimately we are a product of the habits that we have or the habits that we create to try and uphold both the strong and the weak side of our characters. And I'm super excited to talk about it today, to go into this another level, because we've talked about this a lot on the show over the last 18 months. Um, But there's more to explore. James Clear, welcome back to the show. Hello, so good to talk to you. Thanks for having me back. (laughs) Um, Dude, uh, it's been probably near on six years now this show is about six years old there's been about 403 episodes since you were last on the show um talk to me about like i suppose introduce yourself first because loads of people would have, have not have listened to that show so remind us of who you are and what you do and what's happened over the last six years because you have written an incredible book that i will be honest i've not read read the whole book i've read i've sorry I have audio listened to the slightly shortened version. Mm. Um, Yeah, so my name's James Clear. I write about how to build good habits and break bad ones. Uh, I've been writing about habits, peak performance, continuous improvements, decision-making, productivity, variety of other related topics at jamesclear.com for the last six years. Uh, I started in late 2012 and kind of the first habit that really got me off uh, on the right foot and kind of started my growth was I wrote a new article every Monday and Thursday for the first three years. And so that kind of twice weekly article on habits and performance was how I built my audience and started to to develop some expertise around the topic. And after doing that for a few years, uh, I signed a book deal and spent the last three years writing a book, which is now Atomic Habits. And um, thankfully, uh, luckily, that book has been released and has done quite well. Uh, It's been a New York Times bestseller every month since it's been out. And um, I've continued to kind of dive in and explore that topic of the science of habit formation and behavior change. And my interest in the topic is kind of wide ranging. Like I'm, um, I always say that I'm idea agnostic. And what I mean by that is I don't really care what field a good idea comes from as long as it's a good idea. So there are principles from biology, neuroscience, anatomy, physiology, psychology. Uh, there are even some like bits of wisdom from ancient philosophy uh, that have all wove, uh, woven their way into the book in one form or another. And so what I was hoping to come up with was a comprehensive framework for understanding how habits work, but most importantly, like how to change them. Um, kind of my big... Uh, philosophy or approach to the writing and work that I do is I want the ideas to be practical. I want them to be able to be used in daily life. And uh, my hope is that Atomic Habits and the writing that I've done at my website have been able to do that and make it easier for people to build better habits. So it sounds like you approach the work that you do now on a really broad level. Um, All the ideas that come in a result of all those different areas of what many people follow, biology, history. Now, what does your learning look like now then? Do you, do you consume a lot of different information from different areas of um, you know, authors and people on YouTube and stuff that create a lot of your ideas and concepts? Yeah, that's a good uh, that's a good question because it's one of the bigger challenges for me, right? Like nobody, no single person can hope to be an expert on all those different areas. And so I do read widely and I believe in reading widely because I think that's where innovative ideas come from. Um, Pretty much every idea is at least in origin, a very old idea, even if it seems new, but the innovation comes from putting old ideas together in a new way. So it's actually the combination of old ideas that leads to some kind of insight or useful application that we haven't thought about before. So, uh, you know, for example, ride sharing services like Uber or Lyft or Grab, 
Um, that's really what that was, was the combination of a taxi, which had been around for a long time and a smartphone, which had been around for years at that point. And so it was really the combination of the two that made it really powerful and interesting or innovative. So similarly with my work on habits, I try to find ideas from various fields. So I tell stories in the book from authors, surgeons, athletes, musicians, business people, and how they've used uh, the particular challenges or opportunities of their given industry to build better habits and what those applications look like. Um, for example, there's a section in the book where I talk about environment design, which is the idea of structuring your environment to promote good habits. Um, and part of that comes from what's called the kindergarten model of organization. So you go into young classrooms of you know kids of three, four or five years old and look at how they structure the environment to promote good habits in those young children. And so that's an example of pulling from that industry. Um, so I do read widely and I think it's very valuable, but what I specifically do to try to handle all of those big information verticals is find somebody who can curate for me. So uh, follow a researcher who stays up to date and then use them as the person who shares the most important learnings in their particular field. Uh, and you do that across, you know, five or six or 10 different verticals. And then you get exposed to a lot of really good ideas um, without having to, uh, you know, be in 10 places at once. Mm. Okay. So coming in at the top of uh, this habit conversation, I'm always fascinated by individuals' levels of awareness. And I think once you have awareness of what's going on, you can really make progress when you've started to work with clients and you go through this this process of talking to them and starting to break things down, how aware do you find people are of their habits, whether they are both positive or negative? It's a good question. I, I agree. I think the process of behavior change starts with awareness. Um, you can change your behavior without being aware of it. There's some interesting studies that I mentioned in the book that kind of get to that, but you can't really design it. Uh, in any meaningful way, you know, like your, our behavior changes all the time. A different person walks into the room and we act a different way or, uh, the cafeteria at school is laid out differently. And so we pick up different foods because of it, but we don't really realize it. We're not very aware of it. So if you want to design your habits, if you want to kind of take control of them, then self-awareness is a big part of that. And there are kind of two levels. Um, the first level is just getting a handle on what your current habits are. So, I recommend, uh, this is one of the exercises that I talk about in the book, this idea of called a habit scorecard. And you basically just write down all of, in granular detail, all the habits that you perform each day. So you start at the top of your day, like I wake up, I turn off my alarm, I make my bed, I weigh myself, I go into the shower, I brush my teeth and on and on and on. And the goal of that exercise is not really to feel good or bad about your habits. It's not to praise yourself for the good ones or like feel guilty for the bad ones. It's just to get an idea of what am I actually doing each day? So you can become aware of, oh, every morning I turn off my alarm on my phone and then I check Instagram. Should I really check Instagram before I've taken like a single step each day? Uh, probably not, you know, but like you don't really, sometimes you don't realize that you're doing those things until you get it written down in detail like that. So that's the first step is just kind of performing that that analysis of what's actually going on. And then the second thing that you can do is think about a concept that I feel like is central to this process and really uh, perhaps even deeper than awareness, which is a concept that I call identity based habits. And so the idea here is you can ask yourself the question, who is the type of person that I want to become and build your habits around that? which is very different than the way most people approach behavior change. Most of the time when we talk about changing, we approach it not from an identity based standpoint, but an outcome or results based standpoint. We say something like, I want to get six pack abs, or I want to lose weight over the next six months, or I want to double my income this year. It's very results focused. Um, and we use that result as a way to motivate us to do the habit. All right, if I want to get a six pack, then I need to go to the gym four days a week and start cooking meals uh, at home for dinner five nights a week or whatever. And so we come up with a plan and we have an outcome. And implicitly, we just kind of think, if I follow that plan and I get this outcome, then I'll be the person that I want to be. But we don't really give much more thought to it than that. And identity-based habits asks you to invert that process. So it says, 
instead of starting with the outcome, let's start with the, the identity. All right, I wanna get a six pack. Who is the type of person that can have great abs? Well, maybe it's the type of person who doesn't miss workouts, or maybe it's the type of person who um, cooks at home five nights a week. And then you become much more focused on fostering that identity rather than getting that outcome. So rather than letting the identity come naturally, oh, if I get this thing, then I'll be the person I wanna be. You let the outcome nat come naturally. You say, if I act in alignment with that identity, then the outcome will follow as a natural side effect. And I think this gets back to something that I believe is very true about habits, which is your outcomes in life are often a, la often a lagging measure of your habits, right? Like your, your bank account is a lagging measure of your financial habits. Your um, knowledge is a lagging measure of your reading and learning habits. Your weight is a lagging measure of your eating habits. And so what we think needs to change is the outcome. We get a higher test score or look fit or um, make more money. But actually, those are just the results. They, the results don't need to change. It's the habits behind the result. And I think a lot of that starts by asking yourself, who is the kind of person I want to become? And how can I foster the habits that reinforce that new identity? So as you were talking through that, I was trying to think of how people would usually approach this. And as you as you rightly point out in the fitness industry, especially, which is the industry I'm in, people very much always focus on the outcome. The marketing that we have pointed at us is advertising the outcome. And what I kind of felt is that if you always focus on that, your chance of relapse is very high compared mm. to looking at identity because what you're not actually doing is changing yourself as a person. You're just trying to create some kind of plan to get to result. But at the end of it, like you say, nothing's actually changed about inherently who you visualize yourself to be. I think that's a very deep point. You know, like ultimately a lot of the conflict with behavior change is identity conflict. It's like I keep trying to do this thing, but I don't view myself in a new way yet. And eventually those things are mismatched. So like here's a couple other ways to think about it. Um, I had a reader. She ended up losing over 100 pounds, has kept it off for more than a decade. And the question that she would ask herself as she went through her daily life was what would a healthy person do? And so would a healthy person walk five blocks to the next meeting or take a cab or would a healthy person order a salad for lunch or eat a burger and fries? And it's really using that identity based question as a framework for making the next decision in her life, letting the identity lead the way uh, has helped her become that person. And I think that, you know, in a sense, we could say every action you take is like a vote for the type of person person that you want to become. And so each time you take this small action, each time you perform these small habits, it's not really that the individual habit transforms your life, you know, like writing one sentence or doing three push-ups or meditating for one minute, like those things don't transform you overnight, but they do cast a vote for being a meditator or being a writer or being the type of person who doesn't miss workouts, even if it's only in a small way. And eventually casting those votes and building up that evidence of that new identity, it gives you a reason to believe it, you know? And I think that um, the, the last thing I'll add to this is that I feel like this approach is a little bit different than what you commonly hear uh, with things like fake it till you make it. And it's not that like fake it till you make it is a necessarily bad or evil or anything. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with having a positive belief about yourself. But fake it till you make it is asking you to believe something about yourself without having evidence for it. You know, you like keep saying, I'm a healthy person. I'm a healthy person. You repeat this stuff to yourself in the mirror, even though you're not going to the gym. Um, and what I'm saying is instead of that, let's let the behavior lead the way. Let the behavior come before the belief. So do one push up, write one sentence, meditate for one minute, read one page and use that behavior, that small habit as evidence for this new identity. And eventually, if you keep showing up, even if in the, it's in those small ways, you start to have like a little bit of proof that, hey, maybe I am actually that person. And you start to look at yourself in a new way. And I think ultimately, that's like the way to get a habit to stick in the long run. You know, like it's, it's very different to say, I'm someone who wants this versus I'm someone who is this. Like once you adopt that identity, then it becomes easy to stick to the habit in the long run. And I think that small habits help you do that. They help cast those votes that build up evidence of this new person that you're becoming. 
So with what you just said and almost having like an affirmation there, you are talking on one level about a habit and a routine that someone has to implement to create change. Do you also marry that up with almost an affirmation based process? You're encouraging people to change their mental narrative so that they start to feel very differently about the actions that they need to perform and hopefully the identity shift that they want to make for themselves. You know, I mean, this is getting kind of deep now to discuss habits at this level, but ultimately all habit change kind of is teaching yourself to tell a new story. It's teaching yourself to have a different internal narrative. You know, imagine like um, two people walk into a room and there's a pack of cigarettes sitting on the counter and one person has been a smoker. And so they see that pack of cigarettes and a craving arises. They think, oh, I have this urge to smoke a cigarette. And another person has never smoked a day in their life. And so they see that same pack of cigarettes, but it's a totally different internal story. It's like, oh, it's just a pack of cigarettes. They move on. So they don't get this craving. They don't have this motivation to smoke because it doesn't mean the same thing. And so what I'm trying to get at with this idea of identity based habits is that you can teach yourself for uh, you can teach yourself to have the same experience in your life mean something new. For example, right now. Uh, Tuesday night at 6 p.m. might mean, oh, that's the time when I sit on the couch and watch Netflix or browse YouTube or whatever. But it doesn't have to be that way. You could adopt a new identity and 6 p.m. on Tuesday night means, oh, that's the time when I do five burpees. And then after reinforcing that identity enough, it becomes, oh, that's the time when I do 15 burpees and go for a run outside or whatever. And pretty soon after maybe a year or two or three, who knows how long it takes, you cross some invisible threshold and now you don't even really need discipline. You're not even really making a decision. It's just the new story in your mind is, yeah, at 6 p.m. on Tuesday, I work out. That's like what I do. I'm, I'm not like motivating myself to work out. It's just that's what happens then. And so I think small habits give you a path to getting to that new narrative, to getting to that new internal story. And uh, once you adopt that story, once you believe that identity, then sticking with it starts to become much easier. Fascinating. And uh, never be afraid to go deep on this show, James. Um, so <laughs> talking of habits and people initiating change, what do you see coaching other people as the biggest hurdles that people have to be wary of? Because I like to try and coach my clients to say, by the way, this is coming and we're going to start to make a soft plan now because mm. if we don't make a plan, you're going to hit a real roadblock. And we know that we've got lots of things to deal with. We've got environment, beliefs, emotions, identity. What do you see is the, the big things that create the most friction or resistance for people? Yeah, those are good questions. So I, I can think of three that kind of come to mind right away. So let's just, we'll take them like one at a time and I'll mm. pause after each. So the first one is making habits too big. Um, sounds simple, but it's so easy in the beginning to get really amped up and motivated and excited about making a change. And either one of two mistakes happen. Either you pick a habit that's too big. So you know, uh, you're like, all right, I want to get in shape. And you decide I'm going to go run for 45 minutes every day. Um, when you don't need to do that in the beginning, perhaps all you need to do is put your running shoes on and get out the door. And what's interesting about that is a habit that's, that's that small, that's something you could stick to all the time. It often doesn't feel that exciting to people and they immediately jump to the other extreme. They immediately jump to the, the full blown thing. But, um, so that's one challenge. Uh, and the second part of that is sometimes people get excited to make a change. And so then they try to make too many changes at once. So they're like, all right, I'm going to start budgeting for my finances and go for a run. And I'm going to meditate for 15 minutes a day. And I'm going to start reading 20 pages a day. And like they, they try to do all of those changes at once where I think it'd be much more useful to pick one of those habits, get it mastered over a few months and then move on to the next one after the first one has been fully integrated into your life. And I have a simple strategy that I think works well for this. So the, the first part is you can just ask yourself a question. And that question is, can I stick to this habit 98% of the time without fail, no matter what happens? And if the answer to that is no, then you're probably starting too big in the beginning. Um, so this is especially true for getting started. Make it so, so easy that you can do it even when you don't have motivation or you don't have time or things are crazy. Um, you can imagine, for example, if you have a very long day at work, 
and then you come home and your kid is sick and you're getting dinner ready. And then all of a sudden it's like 9 PM and you're exhausted. And the question is, uh, well, do I go for that 45 minute run or not? Well, most people know, like they don't have the energy to do it then. But if the habit is just put your running shoes on and step out the door, well, maybe you could do that. You know, like that's small enough that even on the bad days you could do it. And the point here is that you want to become the type of person that shows up consistently. You want to master the art of showing up before you worry about expanding. I actually had a reader who, uh, he ended up losing a lot of weight and the first step, one of the first things he did was he went to the gym, but he wasn't allowed to stay for longer than five minutes. So he would get in his car, drive to the gym, get out, do half an exercise, get back in the car, drive home. And it sounds ridiculous, right? It sounds silly because like that's not going to be the thing that gets this guy in shape. But what you realize is he was becoming the type of person that went to the gym four days a week, even if it was only for five minutes. And it was learning how to master that art of showing up that really made a big difference. And so the, the phrase that I like to use is that a habit must be established before it can be improved. And so figure out a small way to establish that habit, to make it your new normal, to standardize it in your life. And then you can worry about optimizing and expanding and upgrading from there. So that's the first mistake is uh, choosing a habit that's too big and uh, not sticking with something that you can do in, say, two minutes or less. And the second one, I'm intrigued. Like, I'm on, I'm on the edge here, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> uh, the second one, I think, and this is also very common, especially with, uh, with fitness and health habits, is an all or nothing mentality. Um, I don't know why we do this. It seems to be particularly strong with diets. But, you know, you'll start a new diet or a new nutrition program, you stick to it for seven or eight days, and then on the ninth day, your friends want to go to happy hour and get some drinks, or you binge eat a pizza or something, and then, like, this negative self-talk starts, and you're like, oh, you know, I knew I wasn't going to be able to stick to this for the long term, like, why bother? I guess I'll just, like, go back to eating how I was. And it's this very extreme mentality of, like, if you can't do something perfectly, then you might as well not do it at all. And... um so I think we need a recipe for getting over this. So this comes back to that, the question you asked, like, okay, we know some things are going to be coming, right? So let's develop a plan for dealing with this. And I think the all or nothing mentality is a, a good thing to plan for. And you could also phrase it a different way, which is everybody's going to fall off course at some point. You're going to get busy for work. You're going to get sick. Your kids will have to do something for school. You have to travel. Maybe you need to take care of your parents with something. Whatever it is, like life will throw an emergency or something your way. And when it does, you need to have a plan for dealing with that. So there are two things that I would recommend. Um, the first one is coming up with some if-then scenarios. So like if I have to stay home because my kid is sick at school, then I will, you know, if I have to stay home with my kid, because they're sick at school and because of that I miss my meditation session or yoga workout or whatever the habit is you're trying to build then I will whatever the response is right like I'll wake up the next morning and go early before the next day of work or I will pour all of my effort into making sure that I don't miss the second session and so on right so having some kind of backup plan it sounds simple but the truth is most people don't have that stuff figured out when they start their day they don't have those things written down and we kind of, we often talk about change in very vague terms, right? Like this time it'll be different. I'll try harder or I'm going to eat better or I'm going to actually stick with working out. And all of those are fine goals. Like there's nothing wrong with it, but they, they are not specific enough for you to realize what you should do in the moment, right? So in the, when the moment comes and you do have to travel for work or you do get sick, you don't know exactly what to do because your thought was just, oh, I'll just do better next time. And having a specific plan for how to act helps a lot. So uh, that's the first part of dealing with that. And then the second part is just a kind of a mental philosophy, which I refer to as never miss twice. So it's like, all right, I stuck to the habit or I stuck to the diet for eight days and then I binge ate a pizza on the ninth day. Well, I wish I hadn't done that, but never miss twice. So let me make sure the next meal is a healthy one. Um, or I had been meditating for two weeks straight. And then I had to travel for work and forgot, well, I wish I hadn't done that, but never miss twice. So let me make sure that next morning I get my meditation session in. And that idea, I think it illuminates the most, one of the most important parts of building a habit in the long run, which is figuring out ways to get back on track quickly. 
the people who like perform at the top of most uh, industries, they're not perfect. They make mistakes like everybody else, but they figure out ways to get back on track faster than most people. They don't let one mistake spiral into a variety of mistakes or a long hiatus from their habit. They are able to get back quickly. And if you can do that too, then at the end of the year, those mistakes are just a little blip on the radar. So the first strategy is to make your habits smaller. Um, and the second strategy is to develop this kind of never miss twice mentality or this if then plan for dealing with those times when you fall off course. Nice. Well, if people have that plan as well in the moment, so you use the example of having to stay at home because your kid might be ill or whatever and you're missing a training session. If you've got a plan, you then literally don't spend that evening going, oh, you know, this happened. I'm not going to be able to do this. And, you know, now I feel bad. And now I'm going to put on weight if I can't stick to my workout regime. And actually, if you've got a plan, you can then kind of just sit down with yourself, have a quick word and say, don't worry. It's all good. I know how to deal with this. I've written down a plan. And then kind of that, you know, that self-sabotage, that anxiety, you know, um, and kind of beating yourself up kind of lifts. And you can then just enjoy the moment for what it is, knowing that tomorrow is a new day and you've got a plan for that new day. That's a great point. It kind of uh, removes some of the guilt or some of the um, wor over worry or anxiety about like, oh, now I don't know what to do and I'm off course, you know, like because you already you already know what to do. You already have a plan for dealing with mm. it. So um, anyway, so those are the first two. And then the, the third one, which I think is probably um, the first two are very helpful. So the, the first strategy of making your habits small, that's very helpful for getting started, right? And never miss twice is very helpful for sticking with it. So those are two of the biggest uh, challenges when it comes to habits. How do I get started? How do I make it last? And then the third one actually does both. Um, it motivates you to start each day and it helps you maintain a habit for the long run. And uh, so I could just generally categorize, the, uh, categorize this idea as social reinforcement or uh, social pressure or accountability, whatever you want to call it. But I have a whole chapter in Atomic Habits on this, on the influence of family and friends and your social environment on your habits. But even though I wrote a whole chapter on it, I think I undersold the importance of it. I think it's actually more important than I realized when I was writing the book. So just from a high level, many of our habits that we follow each day, are we do that because they're socially reinforced. Like you might, um, you might walk into a... Uh, you might uh, walk into an interview, right? And you you wear a suit and a tie or a dress or nice clothes. There's no reason you have to do that. You could wear like a bathing suit to a job interview, right? But like you don't because it violates the social norm. It violates the, the social expectation of what habits and what actions you should take in that environment. And that's true not just in formal settings like that. It's true like all day long. Um, you could move into a new neighborhood, and you walk outside on Tuesday night and you see that all of your neighbors have their recycling bins out and you think, oh, we need to sign up for recycling. That's something like uh, that people who live here do. And so then you stick with that habit for 20 years, largely because it's socially reinforced. Same thing is true for like trimming your hedges or your flower bed or trimming your lawn. Like what, why do we care about that stuff? I mean, partially we care about it because it's nice to have a clean trim lawn or a nice looking house. But to a lot of, to a large degree, we care about it because we don't want to be judged by our neighbors. We care about the social reinforcement and that type of influence is prevalent everywhere in our habits. And so I think that the punchline, the takeaway for people who are looking to build better habits, whether it's their health or other areas is you want to join a group to join a tribe where your desired behavior is the normal behavior, because if it's normal in that group, then it's going to be very attractive for you to stick with that habit because it's going to help you belong. And ultimately, like at the deep underlying level, we want to stick with a lot of habits because the, the habit is a signal that helps you belong to the group. You know, you can look no further than like a CrossFit gym as an example. So people join CrossFit and then pretty soon they're soaking up these habits that they weren't even planning on performing. Like mm. they're signing up for paleo meal plans. And they're talking about how good they are at handstand pushups and they're buying certain types of knee sleeves or weightlifting shoes. Uh, they buy a particular brand of weightlifting belt. And like 
nobody was looking to do that stuff when they first walked in, but all of those habits, all of those behaviors are signals to the rest of the CrossFitters that say, Hey, I get it. I belong. Like I'm part of the group too. And, um, so the real thing that locks in habits from a social standpoint is wanting to belong to that tribe. And, uh, so the question to ask yourself is where are groups of people that already have the habits that I want? So how can I join them? And then how can I become friends with those people? Because once you become friends with them, then you want to continue to belong to the group. And, um, I think that it's true, you know, in all areas of life, you know, if you hang out with a bunch of musicians who play music five nights a week, then practicing an instrument every day seems normal to you. Cause that's what everybody you're around is doing. If you hang out with people who, um, go to CrossFit six days a week, then that sounds kind of typical. Um, and for other people who aren't part of those tribes, those actions sound crazy or really ambitious. But it doesn't have to be that way if you can find yourself and integrate with the right group. Surely when an individual tries to implement this, there's a point of friction because they've then potentially got to leave an environment that they are part of. And they start to leave friendships and they're, you know, they're worried about upsetting people. And I might, you know, let's say we draw an example from the gym environment. Someone's going to a certain gym and they have friends there. They know the staff, but they know deep down the gym isn't serving towards their goals. It's working negatively towards the identity that they want to adopt. Um, and I can use an example. I was uh, working with a female a while ago and there was um, there was a, a mild form of eating disorder and a lot of the training and the habits were geared towards uh, extreme orthorexia. Um, there was a kind of an addiction to eating healthy food and looking a certain way. But the gym was reinforcing that norm. But getting her to say, do you know what? This is not good for me. I want to move. And we use the example of a CrossFit gym like you did. Because in CrossFit, like everyone just loves to train. They all muck in. They all support each other. Body composition isn't really the focus. You know, there's people training with their tops off. And, you know, they're not ripped. They look fine. But, you know, I said to her, I was like, look at that person who's training in CrossFit right now. Do you look up to that? Do you aspire to that? Is not is that you know, as the way you phrase it, is that an identity that you would like to adopt? And this girl said, yes, but being able to leave that environment was really problematic because, you know, she's probably a person that doesn't like to offend people, doesn't like to say no, um, is scared of having that conversation of actually cancelling the gym membership, like all those physical actions that then create this, this, well, for some, quite a high level of fear. Yeah, it requires a lot of courage uh, because often when you're um, the truth is most people would rather be wrong with the crowd than right and by themselves. In other words, we often value belonging more than we value truth or accuracy or um, even in some cases our, our identity that we aspire to build. We would rather be um, we would rather be wrong than be alone. And because of that. Uh, it makes changes like that very difficult. And so it requires a lot of courage to have that conversation about canceling the gym membership or something like that to, to leave a tribe. Um, and the other thing though, that can sometimes make it easier, uh, is rather than focusing on the relationships that you're losing or on the, uh, on the challenge of leaving, Instead, don't worry about leaving right now. You can still be a part of that community. Maybe you're not going four days a week. Maybe you're going two days a week or something. Um, but instead, focus on the building of friendships in the new tribe. Uh, because that's ultimately another very difficult challenge. When you ask people to jump tribes, you're asking them to give up friendships they already have and then to have to build and foster friendships that they don't yet have in the new tribe. And that can be challenging too. A lot of people, for example, when they go to the gym for the first time, it feels very uncomfortable. It feels threatening. They're worried that people are judging them or that they don't belong. They're not quite sure what to do. Um, and that's not really a mental state that helps foster friendship. It would, instead, what it feels like is you're on guard the whole time. And so working on getting over that uh, I think can make that transition easier because if you can get through that, if you can get through that period and build those new relationships, then it's like, well, 
I don't really want to, you know, it's not going to be fun to leave this gym, but I do have other friends that I want to hang out with. And that makes it easier to, to manage that. Um, one suggestion that I have for, for doing that, for kind of making that process simpler is you want to join a tribe where your desired behavior is the normal behavior and you already have something else in common with the group. So the example I, all, are, uh, I always think of is uh, my friend Steve Cam runs a website called Nerd Fitness, and it's about getting in shape, but it's specifically organized for people who identify as nerds, uh, who love Star Wars or Batman or Spider-Man or Legos or whatever. And imagine you're someone who's trying to get in shape. The same thing, the tribe, uh, you're joining a tribe where your desired behavior is a normal behavior. All these people at Nerd Fitness are working out. But on the first day, you can walk in and be like, oh, this person also loves Star Wars. So I can become friends with them over our mutual love of Star Wars. And then I can just gradually adopt the health and fitness habits along the way. And, um, you know, so this isn't a radically new idea, but basically what I'm suggesting here is try to find some mutual areas of interest, some shared context, some overlap in other aspects of life that you can use to build those friendships. And then uh, the, the health and fitness or the meditation or the writing habit or whatever it is you're trying to build can come along uh, along the way naturally. And once you've done that and built those new friendships, it becomes easier to transition away fully from the previous tribe that you were in. I love that. And it comes back to your first point about, you know, roadblocks that people face. It's leaving one gym and going to a new community is a, is a real big step. And if you were to sit down and be honest with someone, they'd be scared of that. But you saying to them, how about we just go and try one CrossFit session on a weekend and you know see if you like it, see if you like the people, see if you've got anything in common. Most people could probably say, oh, actually, I'm up, I'm up for training. I'm up for doing that. And actually, I know a friend and I can go with my friend. And it's just a real safe entry point to changing that habit. Um, love that. Um, so, James, to finish up um, this kind of conversation, I love... For people that listen to my shows to really identify both the positive things and the messages that the guests have, but also to identify with some of the struggles and the pain points that all of my guests can have, because I believe that all these amazing things that you and me might do on the internet of doing videos, writing articles, producing books, and kind of almost being on this pedestal where people look up to us. They always think that we have like our shit together 100% and we're absolutely perfect and the adoption of habits and routines has just been easy and you know it's been programmed since childbirth and everything was rosy and it's never the case for everyone and I'd love to kind of ask you the question sort of what habits and routines have you struggled with over the years to adopt and what habits and routines also kind of help you become a better person because I've spoke on the podcast before that I'm not a perfect person and I have to have routines that support some of the the things uh, the kind of character traits that can be negative for me if I don't have the right kind of processes and control mechanisms and if you'd if you'd be happy to open up on that I think it would be amazing for everyone listening yeah, I think it's a great question. You know, I it's kind of uh, it's sort of a funny byproduct of, you know, just the fact that I've written about habits for the last five or six years. People kind of naturally assume that I have my habits all dialed in, right? Just because I'm, I talk about it a lot. But what I always say is my readers and I are peers. We're going through this together. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to figure out what works. And I have a very like scientific or experimental approach where come across a piece of research or an idea that I feel like is good and useful to apply and I'll try that out. And, um, I want my ideas to be used in the real world. And that means not just by my readers, but by myself as well. And so I'm always testing that stuff out to see what works for me and what doesn't. And the only difference between my readers and I is that when I come across something that works, I write about it and share it. But otherwise I'm dealing with the same struggles and challenges that everybody else is. And so uh, I'll give you two areas that I've kind of struggled with for building my habits and then one uh, kind of central area that helps pull some of that stuff in line and helps me deal with, with some of those, you know, kind of darker sides or shadow sides. So uh, the two that I've struggled with, the first one, I guess for lack of a better word, I would call it like a power down routine. Um, 
I have this personal rule where I don't cheat myself on sleep. So no matter when I get to bed, I make sure that I sleep for eight or nine hours. If I'm tra- if I'm training heavy, it's closer to nine, but uh, most days it's like maybe eight or so. And um, so with this power down routine, the problem is not that I don't sleep enough, but that I'm bad about continuing to work late at night. So I get like a, a moment, maybe nine or 10 p.m., where I'm like, oh, maybe I'll just do an hour right of work or an hour of email. And of course, it's never just an hour, right? It turns around and it's midnight or 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. And if I stay up till 1 a.m., well, that means I'm not getting up till 9. And that's fine. I still get enough sleep. But I know that I do better work early in the morning um, and that I feel better and more. Uh, my day just seems to click better when I'm when I rise earlier. So. I prefer to be able to get that handled, but the truth is I still struggle with it. And, um, I had a period this year where I, I was able to do about six weeks really good where I was really on track. And the thing that got me on track was I came back from a long international trip. And so I was really jet lagged. And so that first night I was able to crash at like nine or 10 PM and I just stayed on that schedule for a few weeks. And so that was what, what helped get me, uh, get me clicking again. So anyway, so that's the first one is I guess we'd call it screen time late at night and that upsetting the sleep routine. And then the second habit that I've struggled with and struggled is an interesting word here because um, the habit is dialing my nutrition in. So of the main pillars, uh, strength training, sleep, uh, stretching, recovery, mobility uh, and nutrition, nutrition is easily the one that I struggle the most with of those four. Um, I've got the other ones fairly dialed in. But, uh, I don't have the same level of motivation to fix that one, which is kind of interesting, right? Like I really love training. I I want to go to the gym. Um, but I don't want to dial my nutrition in the same way. And so that's been an interesting one for me to kind of deal with. Cause it's like, it's a challenge in the sense that I think it could be better, but I don't feel it as much, right? It's easier for me to dismiss. Um, so Uh, I don't know what that means. You know, sometimes when you don't have the motivation to do a habit, it actually is kind of instructive because it teaches you, you keep saying you want this thing, but maybe you don't actually want it, right? Maybe you just like the idea of it. You like the idea that you could be praised for it or that people, uh, applaud that type of habit, but you don't actually want it personally. And so what you need to get over is the social, uh, the social influence of it. Um, and then other times, which might be the case with this, you do actually want it, but you need to figure out a different strategy because the way you're attacking it has not been effective. So, so anyway, so those are two that I've struggled with. Um, the, uh, the solution, not necessarily to both of those, but one of the habits that helps both of those and that has, uh, helped a lot of areas of my life is strength training exercise. That's kind of my keystone habit. If we want to call it that, I know that if I get in the gym three or four days a week and get some good training in, then the rest of my life kind of gets pulled in line. Yeah, I do get the benefits of exercise and strength training, but I tend to have an hour or so where I have this post-workout high where I can think very clearly, so that improves my focus. I sleep better at night because I'm tired from training, which means I wake up the next day and I have more energy. Um, I also tend to naturally eat better when I'm training than when I'm not. It's the periods when I'm not training or when I'm traveling a lot that I actually eat the worst, uh, which is funny because you would think, oh, you spend this time in the gym, then maybe you're like, oh, well, you could rationalize it and be like, oh, I could have some ice cream or whatever. But I don't usually do that. Instead, when I train, what my brain thinks is like, oh, I don't want to waste it. Let's make the most of this, right? And so then I actually eat better. And at no point was I trying to build better focus habits or sleep habits or energy habits or nutrition habits, those all kind of came as this natural side effect, this like ripple from making sure I got in the gym. So those kind of keystone habits, I think are important to ask yourself, like, what is that for me? You know, like if you're a listener right now, I think you could just ask the question, what do I do on days when things go well for me? What do I do on days when I don't fall in to the same vices that sometimes plague me? And, uh, you'll often come up with a list of maybe two or three things. Maybe it's exercise. That's a common keystone habit. Uh, for some creatives, it's like going for a walk outside each day, just getting outside for 10 minutes. The big one, um, for performers like comedians or musicians, athletes, visualization is often cited as a keystone habit. They look, they visualize in their mind how the performance is going to go. And then they step out on the stage or onto the court or whatever. 
Um, and then another uh, interesting one is budgeting. I've heard from a lot of readers who when they budget and pay off debt and get their finances in line, then they kind of naturally feel motivated to work out or to take some other change in their life. So I don't know what it is for you. It could be any of those might be something different. But the point is to figure out what that that biggest lever is for you. What is that keystone habit that pulls the rest of your life in line? Focus your energy there and you can kind of curtail some of your bad behavior or some of the habits that you struggle with just by mastering that one thing. You talking about training is interesting because I often talk with clients about momentum and how they get momentum and it's almost like your workout gives you momentum that so much of your other aspects of your lifestyle fall into place and you know it's it's easy to lose that momentum when kind of things build up so then you can and as you've highlighted in this podcast brilliantly is it then maybe about changing your expectation and what habits you can do because you know you might now have a newborn child and actually you can't go to the gym every day now you can only go two or three days a week and you can only go for 40 minutes because you kind of feel a bit burnt out but that gives you enough momentum to allow other things to come into line give yourself some personal time makes you feel strong makes you feel fit makes you feel good about yourselves so habits is quite often about just maybe having a couple of things that allows everything else to just literally melt into place I think that's a really smart way to put it. Um, and it reminds me of kind of one uh, final thing that I think of a lot and that I think is useful for, for people to keep in mind, which is this question of what season am I in right now? You know, so like for me, I'm in a season in my life where I can be very career focused. I don't have kids yet. Uh, so career and personal health are like they're kind of those burners are on full blast. Those are important things for me right now. Uh, meanwhile, maybe family life or friends even are a little bit on the back burner. And then at some point I will have kids and that'll signal like a different shift, a change in seasons. And so then maybe the career burner has to turn down a little bit and family gets turned up. And I think the the question, what season am I in? It helps you deal with those trade-offs. Like nobody likes that, right? None of us want to have to choose like that. But the, the fact is that we all have trade-offs in life. And I think understanding what season you're in and what habits are maybe most important during that season, it helps you figure out solutions to some of those problems. For example, I was just talking to a friend yesterday. He has a one and a half year old and a four year old. And he's like, I just can't train the way I used to train. So his new exercise habit for this season is he does 50 burpees a day for time. Um, and that's all he can do right now because he's busy parenting and with his job and other stuff. But He's okay with that because he has a, a habit that fits for that season. And I think the more clarity that you have around that, around what season you're in and what habits can help you maintain the momentum that you want during that season, uh, the better maybe you can deal with some of those natural trade-offs in life. Amazing. Uh, James, uh, the interview today has been uh, stellar. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. It's been uh, amazing to just listen to you and your ideas. Um Obviously, people need to go and check out your work. Uh, I've been a fan for a while. I now feel slightly ashamed that I've only listened to the shortened version of your audiobook. And I feel that just the way that you've spoken today, I have to go and read uh, your full book and all the concepts. So I'm going to hold my hand up there and tell the audience now that I'm going to go and do that. Um, I want people to find out where you're at. Please tell people... Uh, Amazon, I'm sure, for the book, the website, and your social media. Yeah, well, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was great to talk again. And um, if you want to find more of my work, you can just go to jamesclear.com. Uh, if you click on articles, they're organized by topic, so you can kind of poke around and see what's interesting to you. And then if you click on books, you'll find links to Atomic Habits uh, and the Habit Journal, which is uh, a journal that I put together that has habit trackers in it and a couple other things that make it easier to build habits kind of on a daily basis. And um, if you'd like to just cut straight to the book, then you can just go to AtomicHabits.com. Awesome. Dude, thank you so, so much. Um, if you are listening to this and you've enjoyed this, please do us the massive honor of giving it a retweet or a share. If you think a friend could benefit from this information, then please forward it on to them. Tag them in a post on social media. This information is for free. It's hugely valuable. Please keep helping the world uh, change and move forward and create 
more positive momentum in their lives. If you want to reach out to James, you know where to find him on social media. Head over to jamesclear.com. His work is brilliant. It's one of the reasons I got him so early on in my podcast and I wanted to get him back. Um, so James, thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you again. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the opportunity. And for all of you listening, the last thing you need to go and do is go and have an awesome day. Goodbye.